Good Friday, everyone. Welcome to the VolQuest.com podcast with Austin Price, Jesse Simonton, and Rob Lewis. I'm Brent Hubbs. Glad to have you along on this Friday, a mailbag edition of the podcast. But before we get to those questions, we want to welcome to the program Blue Water Climate Control, proud sponsor of the podcast. And Jeremy and his staff over there do great work. We're going to talk about them throughout the podcast in the coming weeks as well. Uh, but uh, happy to have them aboard and uh, a part of the VolQuest.com podcast is, again, lots going on for Tennessee, lots going on in recruiting, lots of unknowns. we got coaching stuff, search stuff. We've got hoops. we got a lot to get to uh, on this uh, edition of the podcast, again, brought to you by Blue Water Climate Control. All right, let's just jump right into it, guys. First question right out of the gate. I was asked some, you know, kind of get settled in type deals, but let's jump right into it because you know this is going to be asked a million times. PTSD Vol wants to know, give a full rundown, give a layout of Zach Evans. Pertaining to his recruitment. Um, Lay it all out there is well, what he says. you know, <laughs> he's not met with any coaches this week. Um, you know, no in-home visits. Uh, will he go anywhere this weekend? At this point, I'm going to lean towards no, and uh, which would give Tennessee and any other school that's really kind of into him Another ch kind of swing here, uh, you know, before uh, before they have to come off the road officially. So, um, you know, would be surprised if, if if he took the visit by anybody at this point. If you're not taking one all week, why well, take one now? But hey, you can't you can't you know discount the chance if he does not take an official visit somewhere. I, again, I, Tennessee, Ole Miss, and then Texas. You know. I think it's a three team race. I mean, I think I think that's what it is right now. See, I think but the kid's shot down A and M so many times. I, he had a hundred percent, but I just I. With this kid, it, oh no, there's there, there, nothing. That you, the, there has been so many. Uh, I forget where I read it exactly, but they did like a beat by beat blowdown of, of Evans's kind of the, the the roller coaster nature of his recruitment, where he's pushed back his announcement date at least three different times. The irony is he's never publicly committed anywhere. We just, we know he signed with Georgia, but he's never publicly committed anywhere. He's allegedly silently committed to multiple schools. Uh, he's missed multiple games, you know, this season due to suspension two or three at the beginning of the year and then the state championship game. The, the reality is, is that no matter what happens come Wednesday, there will be no final answer to this Zach Evans deal until he shows up on, on, on said campus. I agree. And, and again, you, know, you never know if a home – I mean, Texas a and to me, because they're close – I don't think he wants to necessarily stay close, but maybe that's the easier thing for him to do ultimately. I, I, I think I, I'm with, I'm lean more towards Austin that it's probably Tennessee Ole Miss, but I just don't know that you can rule anybody out at this point, oh, you, which I think is what you're saying, which is why I, I think you put Texas A&M in, in there as the third school. I don't see it being Oregon. I don't think he's going to end not up. Unless, at, not at, unless he visits Oregon or, or this Southern weekend, Cal. Yeah. yeah, unless he goes well, out he there and – with the LOI situation, could he just decide one week anywhere to visit, visit Oregon in March? He could. I mean, that's the thing that I, I mean, I'm, He's got know. one more official left? One more yes. official, yeah. That he could take it in. But to clear, up, to clear up that point, because this was asked about to AP and I, okay, so Jeremy never went in home. Because Jeremy never went in home, this is – just because Zach Evans is a five-star, this kind of stuff happens all the time where a kid may not sign, a la Bryce Thompson. Jeremy couldn't go in home with Bryce Thompson – months later because he never used an in-home visit he's off the road right. after this weekend right and, and so that was the, the, multiple folks on, on on the gq were asking ap and i about that you know can't no he can't get in he jeremy pruitt did not get to go in home other coaches didn't either but specifically this week that was a bullet that that tennessee was unable to use to this point i mean obviously they could you know go later tonight or you know, but we do not expect that. Or Saturday. Yeah, no, I, mean, yeah. I mean, you could in theory, but it doesn't. If he hadn't let you in all week, it's hard to imagine I mean, he's going to say, "Hey, come on down Saturday and hang out." The with safe me. thing to do is just to say it's a to it's a total coin flip between fifty different schools, and 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 you wouldn't be inaccurate there. Um, you know, again, I, I lean back. I, what I said the other day, I, you know, I think Tennessee, you know, is in a pretty good spot here. But with this kid. It, there, it literally changes by the hour. He was taking a visit to Florida State this weekend. Then he wasn't. Then he was going to Oregon this weekend. Then he wasn't. He had some interest in Ohio State, and then that falls through. I mean, it, it literally it, it changes all the time. You know, Florida State doesn't have an offensive line. Ole Miss has no history of being a real contender. You know, likes a lot of things about Tennessee, but obviously there's still some question marks there. Um, you know, Georgia moved on. You know, or he moved on from them, whatever you want to say. Right. Um, you know, LSU, 
you know, they lost traction last month, you know, for other reasons. Yeah. All right. So let's move on to uh, Maval, different Maval. So it's not her. Okay. This is a different one. Wants to know. Uh, Identity let's, theft. Let's just assume that Tennessee does not land Evans. Who are the key running back prospects for 2021? Travion Henderson, you know, uh, Tennessee's, you know, going up there today to see him. And that includes Jay Graham. So, um, you know, Tennessee's going to go see Travion. Cody um, Brown. Cody Brown will be here this weekend. This weekend. Um, can, know, Jay get, can Jay get him in with Shipley? Yeah. You know, I think, I think uh, my Shipley seems like a real stretch to me. I just think I that kid's going to go to Notre Dame, Penn State, one of those type schools. Um, you know, but I, I do think that, you know, Tennessee can you know make a big impression on Travion, you know this you know this evening when they go up there to watch him uh, play bat. I think he's playing basketball, um, you know, up up in Virginia. So there's three names there, right, Jesse. What are the impact? What are the names for possible impact edge rushers in 2021? This is a position that we've really talked about since Jeremy Pruitt's been the head coach here. Who are their edge guys? Where's the difference maker edge-wise? Well, they've started to host them the last few weeks, and they'll have more on campus this weekend. I mean, Jeremiah Williams is a guy that they like that, we, you know, we had a story on. Uh, where does a guy like Junior Colson kind of fit in the mix? Um, there's been several guys uh, that, that are in Alabama. Um, what's, the, what's the five-star that was up here two weeks ago, AP, that I talked to? Uh, I'm blanking on his name right now. Um, he plays – Plays it plays in in, in Birmingham. Uh, I'll think oh, Dylan Brooks. Is, Dylan Brooks. Dylan Brooks. He's certainly near the top of the list. Uh, now, Rook. how does it how does it kind of shake up? You know, he he was kind of tight with Kevin Sher, but Rook. Ansley's been on him. Rump uh, as well. And that one's gonna be a tough pull. I mean, you know, uh, he's a kid who he's been up here a bunch of times. Brooks, I think, has visited Tennessee four or five times in the last year, but he's also been. At Alabama and Auburn, about as many times right. as well. So, but those are a few names. I mean, that th th this is, a, I think, a fairly decent crop of, of outside linebacker prospects. Why do you think? And this go, this person will still this question. Why do you think Tennessee has struggled at that position in recruiting? Why have they not been able to close with a higher, more high-profile names there? Anybody got a theory? You know, I'm not pointing at it. You. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I mean. I have no theory on that. It, uh, some of it's uh, some of, some of it's befuddling to me. Well, know. I just you know, I mean, I, I think it's. Ojolari was the miss because right. he would have been that guy for Tennessee. I mean, he he, he you know, he received r rankings bumps from every service this year. You know, after a solid senior season and after what he kind of did on the camp circuit over the summer. So, uh, it is an issue that needs correcting though because. These other schools are not having that problem. Well, Alabama's landing Tim Williams, Georgia's landing Mikel Sherman, and, and Nolan Smith. You know, LSU's got BJ Ojolari. Uh, Clemson's haul is incredible uh, this year. So, the, the 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 schools that Tennessee is chasing in, in terms of wants to be like both in the recruiting rankings and obviously, uh, you know translating that to on-field success, those schools are not having that problem. So Tennessee does need to kind of get this fixed in this cycle. Well, and I think more pe I mean, I think it's the most coveted position out there. I mean, it used to be corner, but there's a, there's a lot of guys, good athletes. You can find corners, okay? I think when you talk about defensive guys, it's not a three-tech, it's not an inside nose. I think the most coveted position is the outside edge guy because he's such a difference maker in the game. And now there's so many people running the – the saving defense, this type of defense, there's more options for some of those guys to go with. Um, and, and quite frankly, George has been in a better place, and, and Alabama and these other schools have been in a better place than Tennessee And has. I will say, Tennessee does have one guy right now who we, we'll see. Did, did they get in late? And, and did, does Morvin Joseph outperform you know, his ranking? I mean, he was a four-star. Uh, but he was not, you know, a top 200, top 150 guy. But he's a guy that Tennessee has penciled in to be one of those edge guys, obviously, in this previous class. All right, Rob, bonus question. Uh, Tennessee likely to land a big man to finish off the class in spring, or are they done? I mean, for right now they don't have a scholarship available. Now, that said, one, is, one or two has opened up, you know, every spring since Rick's been here, and that's not a Tennessee thing. That's a, you know, that's a national trend. I, I lean towards thinking – that there will be somebody else joining this class, whether that's a grad transfer, 
Dylan Cardwell is still out there, the big man from Georgia that took an official visit in the fall. He didn't sign in November, so certainly you know keep Cardwell in mind. Tennessee's still in contact with him, but um, I think you know just had to guess today, and, and this is based on Rick's track record of you know at least having a little bit of turnover in the spring, and I, I know that they would like to add a, add a big, and again whether that's a via the transfer route or whether it's Cardwell, you know I, I think they'll probably add some one, but again, somebody's got to leave. All right, Nova Vol 99 to you, Rob. Rick has mentioned a few times limiting Jordan Bowden's minutes due to performance. Do you think that's something he will really ever do, or is that <laughs> just talk? Uh, do you think that he will play more of his bench? He's talked about it all year long. Is I mean, he, really he went in, I, I've, I've talked to him about this on Thursday, and I mean, he went in hard, like, you know, I've got to play the freshman, I've got to do it, I've got to make myself do it, you know, yada, yada, yada. And, you know, it's not the first time he's talked about that, but I mean, you're coming off a game where, I mean, John Fulgerson played 35 minutes the other night. E. Pons played 36 minutes. I, I mean, I just don't think that's sustainable, especially for Fulgerson, because, I mean, he's, you know, against a guy like Reggie Perry, I mean, that's a tough physical matchup for John. I mean, he, he needs to be down 26, 27, I think. But, Rick, I mean, Rick says these things. Then Camwa goes in, you know, misses a defensive switch. Devontae Gaines throws it out of bounds, and boom, they're done for the night. And I, I just don't know if he's going to get past that. I mean, we'll, we'll see. I, I know for sure, like his assistant coaches are telling him that, you know, we need to play these guys, you need to give them a, a little bit of a longer leash. But it just, you know, it, it on Thursday that sounds great. You know, Saturday afternoon with eight minutes left in the first half when, you know, Devontae sells one into the second row. I, I don't know if that's going to hold up. But we'll see. As for Jordan, I, I don't think Brick's going to be, you know, cut his minutes back for performance. And frankly, Jordan's been, you know, certainly, I, I think, playing well. The last few games. He's played better for sure. I mean, you know, he hadn't shot the ball as well as you like, but at the other night he got the ball to the rim. Yeah, that's it, what he's was been more assertive. That's what he's been doing in line. the last four games since the Georgia debacle. He has really opened up another window as far as his game goes, putting it on the floor and getting, getting to the rim. All right, uh, 10 Vol 2004. If the staff lands Beckwith and Weidman, do any receivers get moved to corner? And do, does Tennessee take McConkey if they miss out on Evans? Uh, no, I don't think the staff's going to take McConkey. Yeah, I don't think so either. I, I don't think they're going to sign him to a national. I, and, and I don't. I don't see a guy I don't moving. see them moving because they're, they're again they're lower than the number than they want. They're so they, they feel like they need to add multiple guys. All right, VFL eighty four with Rocker's contract ending. Any idea on the status there and any other coaching news upon this? All right, look, nothing has been formally announced. But the, the, the thought has been, the, the feeling has been, it's been reported in multiple places, Joe Osavat will end up getting the tight ends job. That's not been announced by Jeremy Pruitt at this point, and that would move Brian Niedermeyer to defense. Um, so, but that's been the feeling and, and the thought process out there for 10 days or so that that's where that thing is going to land officially. Especially once Pruitt. they got Jay. Right. Now the question is, what, what about Rocker? I mean, I, I think he's just going to work. I mean, I don't have any idea. Do you? Much like Zach Evans, I quit trying to predict that one a long time ago. I mean, I, you know, I, I mean, he's, he's going to be on the staff. Here. Yeah, I agree. I, I think, think he's he, be I think he'll staff. be on the staff. Yeah, I, I do think. I think he'll be on the Tennessee staff in in 2020. Uh, moving in forward. some capacity. Yeah. All right, Dougie 23. What does Jay Graham's hire mean for the running back room, particularly Eric Gray? Is Graham known for his coaching chops and development of players? Curious to see the improvement of the running backs, especially if a blue chip guy isn't landed in this class, a la Zach Evans. You know, I think I think Jay, you look at Jay's history, I think Jay's done a good job with running backs. I mean, I think his running backs have been productive. Yeah. South Carolina, Florida State. Again, I, I understand why some people have thrown some criticism his, criticism his way for what he, for, you know, for recruiting. You know, in 2012 here, but <laughs> nobody could land anybody. That was a lame duck. It was a lame duck. The most lame duck staff yeah. that's ever been. Yeah, correct. And I mean, as one staff member who's on this staff now, that was on it then, pointed out to me earlier this week, Jay got Derrick Henry to campus like five or six I times, remember. and was the only reason that Tennessee was in that at all, going against Alabama, who had won multiple national titles under Nick at that point. No, I agree. And I think here's the thing about Jay from a recruiting standpoint. He was asking about coaching. I think Joe, I think Jay has coached in this league and has been successful as an on-field coach in this league. From a recruiting standpoint, I think Jay will be better at Tennessee than he was at A&M because I think geographically it's better for him. I think he has more ties to the Carolinas, Virginia, than he does to any place in Texas. And so I think when he got west of the Mississippi, 
establishing and building relationships was something he, he was working on in Texas, whereas when he gets back to Tennessee, he's getting re reacclimated with some old friends, some old people, that some older guys that he's dealt with, coaches, handlers, um, various things like that, that he's had to deal with and he's dealt with in the Carolinas for years. I, I think that's an easier transition for him to do that than it was to go from Florida State to Texas I think that's a great point. I mean, I think that's something that is not, you know, a parent in recruiting a lot of time is, I mean, in Jay's case, former players that he played. I mean, how many of those guys now, even if they're not high school coaches, are members of the community, you know, that are that are dialed in, you know, in different places? I mean, I'm, I mean, we we all know a lot of guys like that who may, you know, maybe they're not the high school coach, but maybe, maybe they coach youth football, or maybe they had, you know, some kid on, on their basketball team with, with their own kids at some point in time. There's a lot of dudes like that sprinkled around. I, I, I mean, I feel like I knocked out this question in, my, in the column I wrote. Right. You know, I mean, I, I one of the – the bonuses or pluses I thought in the hire was that, you know, I think I wrote that he has legitimate chops as an assistant coach. You know, Carlos Williams at Florida State was not a running back when he got to Florida State and he ended up scoring 20 some odd touchdowns. You know, that was a guy that Jay helped develop at that position. Obviously, Dalvin Cook was a phenomenal talent, but he did quite well under Jay. Um, Devontae Freeman, Trevion Williams at, at, at A&M, uh, you know, had the, had the single season all purpose uh, yard. So I think the 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 next step for Jay is can he bring the most out of a guy like Ty Chandler, who has potential, but we haven't really seen it uh, come together to be that I think kind of complete back that maybe folks thought he was going to be three years ago when he when when he came here at, uh, uh, from NBA. All right, VFL eighty four wants to know any twenty one prospects to keep an eye on in terms of a commitment watch or somebody that Tennessee is really surging forward for you, like where they're at with 21s. Not well, necessarily going to commit immediately, <clears throat> but Tennessee's positioned themselves well. Well, I mean, I, I'm interested to see where they are this coming out of this weekend with uh, two guys. First one being Damian Robinson. And he um, was actually a name I forgot, you know, I, I, an outside I, linebacker. I, I'm not going to say that it, it's Isaac Washington 2.0 here, but I do think that there's a, a little bit of a shot there um, potentially you know, for him. And then the other one would be uh, – uh, the tight end from the state of Georgia, Miles Campbell. You know, I think that one's another one that, you know, at least Bears, you know, looking at going into this weekend. Yeah, I, w I would agree with you. But, I mean, I think you'll see some Tennessee continue to search for. I don't think you're going to see Tennessee come out with three or four commitments uh, on this last weekend before, no, the, no, before no, no. the dead period. But I do think Campbell's a guy that's really intrigued by Tennessee, obviously, and Robinson's been down here multiple times. I, look, Joe osvet has got three or four guys from – Maryland coming down this way for the for the weekend. Um, I mean, he, I mean, he has done a good job getting guys to come to campus, That's right. and they're supposed to be in campus this weekend. Uh, volunteered eighty seven. Does Fulmer spend more time, less time, or what you'd expect on sports like tennis, swimming, etc., versus his passion for football? Secondly, on Fulmer, how do you feel he does on the fundraising side of the AD of the AD duties? Look, I, I mean, football drives is the train that pays all the bills, and that's I mean, ha has he? dismiss tennis swimming or any other sport absolutely not we, we but, watched him walk out of the complex two fr two uh, saturdays ago to go to a tennis match right does does is is football the focal point it better be right rob yeah I mean, that's why he got the job <laughs> I mean, that's why it. that's why he's the athletic director right and is, is to fix it in terms of fundraising i think the more you win the easier it is to fundraise and um, I, I think that if football can continue to grow, I think you'll see their fundraising continue to be. And I think he's good. good. I think he's comfortable with that. Oh, that, I think that kind so. of stuff. Yeah, very I mean, he, comfortable. And he I mean, he did that role with the president when he was fundraising on the academic side, and has no problem going out and and, and speaking and, and working on fundraising. So I, I don't I don't think that's an issue um, in, in any way, shape, or form. And the coffers are only going to continue to fill up here when you get the 46 million or whatever it was Good that came gracious. out and and that doesn't even and that's with the quote unquote bad CBS deal. <laughs> that's, right. that's the bad TV deal. <laughs> that's the right? bad TV deal that the other one's going to kick <coughs> off with an extra 20 mil here in 2 years. And that's why you see schools like Mississippi State paying 5 million dollars to coaches. Everybody wants to know how did you do that? A, you're getting that 46 million, and you know what's coming. Bo Pelini getting of, almost two million to be a defensive coordinator. A lot of people are spending money before they get it, you know, because they know what's coming in the new TV deal. Um, and you've got some places that people are going, hey, let's just go build something or renovate something because we need to spend some money somehow, some way yeah. here, um, which is crazy to think, but that's <laughs> that's really what happens. All right, V4LZ, V4LZ, Austin, I got that one right. <laughs> 
Do coaches sell strength of schedule to potential recruits? Obviously, if you come to the SEC, uh, that conference's talent transcends the NFL, but playing schools like Oklahoma home and away, is that something specifically Tennessee might sell? Big games don't happen as often as they once did. I think when you have the I think some schools sell that big neutral site game. I'm sure they talk about it. they play Oklahoma, but I think if you play in this league, it just kind of sells itself, you know, because um, everybody knows it's the best league, the most competitive league. Yeah, I mean, and I, don't you? I mean, it's. I mean, for me, it's it, the appeal for a kid or, or his parents, or if they're really, you know, thinking that way, is not so much playing a national TV game in prime time. It's like NFL scouts, and they're. I mean, how many are in the press box every week for an SEC game? I think if you're Oklahoma, you sell it more than I agree with that for Tennessee. sure. I think Oklahoma yeah. sells more. Hey, we're going home and home against for the sure. SEC. I mean, if you're if you're a kid with NFL aspirations, every NFL scout or every NFL you know scouting department is going to watch the you, you know your game against Georgia, your game against Florida, your game against Alabama. I mean, that's you're going to get seen. Yeah, the exposure is not going to be an issue if you go anywhere in the SEC. Yeah. All right, go Vols 21. I'm going to throw this to you, uh, Jesse, because it starts with your, one of your favorite words. Optics suggests Osavat's doing well in the DMV area, at least getting some interest in the Northeast. He's paid his dues on staff, and Pruitt obviously appears to have faith in him. Is this Pruitt giving him a one-year show-me-what-you-can-do type deal, or do you think this is Pruitt um, more of a longer-term deal? I don't think he's going to get a one-year deal. I think if, if this thing goes through and they sign it and everything becomes official, I think he's on a two-year contract. Because I think everybody gets a two-year contract. I don't yeah. think he's given a one-year deal. I agree, but not. But I think every every coach and and these guys would tell you that behind the scenes understand that they're just, you know, one year away from not being on staff the next year. So, Joe's done a good job. I don't know how much paying his due. I mean, he's paid his dues going up to the JUCO and and that kind of stuff. But, I mean, he he's been here for two years as an off-field you know assistant. That's not atypical, and especially when you see some of the other guys like Charlie Strong. You know, are, are, are in similar uh, QC roles now. Um, I do think Joe has done a nice job getting folks to campus. You know, I think his ties and, and kind of dogged effort with Christian Valu, that, that, that probably Tennessee's, you know, 1A or 1B quarterback target right now in the 21 class uh, ha, has helped him. And so now we'll get to really see. You know, his him truly spread his wings if he is on staff as kind of an on on field recruiter. All right, Deshaun, thirteen surprise breakout player on each side of the ball. I'll I'll go first on, on this deal. For for me, um, I think defensively, I think Cravarius Crouch is going to be a different player because I think he's going to be playing a position that he's much more comfortable in. So I'll go Crouch on the defensive side. Um, offensively, I, I think you're going to see. I don't know that Eric Gray's. I don't think Eric Gray's going to do Vanderbilt, you know, every <laughs> if he, game. If he does, if he then, does, it's, <laughs> until he may win it all. <laughs> right. But I do think you'll see. You'll continue to see because the offensive line is going to be better. You know, more continuity. They should grow if they stay healthy. I think you'll see Eric Gray be more productive, like he was the last couple of games, compared to the middle stretch when he was a non-factor. I'm going to ride the hot hand of and, and the notion that uh, D'Angelo Gibbs is going to be. That's, that's who, who I was going to say. You know, who they hope he is. Okay. Um, so I'll go him on offense. De- defensively, I'm going to go. Uh, you want to go Flowers, but he's hurt all the time. That's what I was going. I was going. That's it. That's it. That's it. From the tip of my tongue as well. No, I wasn't. I was going to go. Um, I just I was, knew AP liked Trayvon. I was going to go Alante Taylor. I like Trayvon too. I just don't know if he can stay on the field. Yeah. You know, Alante Taylor. Yeah. Alante Alante is a good. Pick. They need they need Flowers to be good. I'll say that. Yeah. And and he may be the most important one of the most important guys on defense. And, and my other pick for that for that very same reason will be Kayvon Bennett. Because I think they they need Kavon to be, yeah, they not do. not just uh, a Robin, but they need him to kind of assume Daryl Taylor's Batman role in terms of production. And 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 Taylor was not always the most consistent, but if you eliminate that from the equation, Tennessee's really going to be missing some pass rush uh, in 2020. So they need Bennett to kind of t- take a leap. Certainly. And he's progressively gotten better. Yes. So I'm not saying it's not in there, but I think they need him to be a breakout guy. Hey, let me tell you a little bit about Blue Water Climate Control, where where you get comfort today. When your system breaks, you want a company that will get there fast and do the right repair the right way the first time. Blue Water respond, responds to more than 90% of their calls the same day that they are received. Blue Water offers 24-hour service, and all of their technicians are trained and certified. You can call Blue Water today at 865 865- 299-2290. That's 
2290. Mention VolQuest, you'll get a diagnostic te free for rep with repairs. Excuse me, you'll get your diagnostic test free with repairs. Again, that's 865 299 2290 for Blue Water Climate Control. Jumping back in here to the podcast, Vols 3131. Are you surprised with how many kids have said there's a lack of communication with Tennessee coaches? Hardy has said it. Now Peyton Page has said it as well. I've not heard that from Peyton Page. Yeah, he said it to Friedman the other day. That I mean, he just said, heard? Well, yeah, I mean, he, you know, likes him a lot, doesn't hear from him as much as he'd like to, something to that effect. Well, it's interesting because in Orlando he was not talking about that. Yeah. You know, I, he was talking I, a lot about how he heard from and And kids, you he know, was coming off a good, good Clemson visit, so. Yeah, I'll read you exactly what he said here. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you know, sometimes that's a little bit, you know. Tennessee is on me right now. He said it's Coach Niedermeyer and Coach Tracy. They're really cool. We don't talk often, but I feel we have a connection. I mean, they got to get him back on campus, you know, and they got to continue to work there. I, I do think that Tennessee, um, and I think that this is something moving forward, that they, they probably have to start the process a little earlier sometimes of getting things moving. I, I, you know what I'm saying? I, yeah, I've I think if you kids, hey, I, I'm, already, I'm already locked into this camp date at X school. You don't hear that as much with Tennessee. I think that's something they can do a better job Yeah, like of. right now, as we, you know, said here on the you know, last day of January, the invitation should be going out for the April 18th orange and white game. You know, I mean, because, it, you know, people start penciling stuff in, you know, and there'll be other games that day. So I would uh, I'd be working hard to go ahead and get those kids, you know, hearing that date and locking them in. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm with you 100% 100% on that. Uh, let's go to Volkins. So with the staff truly only recruiting one tight end this year in Darnell Washington since they saw both – Gilbert and Beck with his wide receivers. Should we see in that a direction that this offense? Should we see that as a direction the offense is going? Should we expect more big wide receivers in the slot, close to the line of scrimmage, and less two tight end sets, um, or maybe less formations with a tight end at all? Basically, what he's saying is, is Jim Cheney going to spread it out a little bit more and get away from some tight end stuff? We'll see. I mean, that, this is something I want to kind of dive into more during the off season because Tennessee ran a ton of twelve personnel this last season and and not having Dominique Wood Anderson on on the roster anymore who assumes that number two role you know is 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 more incapable of even playing half as many snaps where's a guy like Sean uh, Brown or Jackson Lowe kind of fitting into the equation that that's going to be one of the because that was such a fixture with what they did a, a lot of times especially with some of the zone uh, running game stuff so having having both you know Pope being able to be utilized in multiple spots with, with Wood Anderson right there on the line. All right, uh, Rob, to you. Vescovi is clearly getting more comfortable on the floor. He's playing, quote, his game. Is Barnes encouraging him to continue to play his game with some of the no-look passes and some of the risky stuff he's doing, or is he trying to rein that in um, and get him to play a little more under control and not be as risky with the ball? No, I think he's – I mean, I don't think Rick has a real problem with, with the, the kind of passes that he's talking about. and. and I'd have to go break it down, but I don't think I don't. The majority of his turnovers, I don't think, have come from him, you know, trying to do something, you know, the little, you know, dropping it behind to somebody. I, mean, I think it's just been sloppy or you know, not, you know, dribbling into bad situations. Um, and I, I think pretty clearly he's getting a handle on it. I think also think Rick's taking <coughs> the ball out of his hands a little bit more than he did lately. I give it to Josiah, which is, you know, maybe limited turnovers a little bit, but I don't know. I, I don't know that it's helped the offense. But I don't. I don't think Rick has a problem with the, the kind of flair that the poster's asking about. I, I think that, you know, as long as he, you know, kind of blends that in with not not getting himself into trouble, then uh, I think Rick's fine with him. Again, I think most of his turnovers have not been from, you know, trying to trying to make the, the flashy assist as opposed to you know just getting himself into bad spots on the court, being lazy, he gets pressure, that kind of thing. Yeah, I agree with you there. T. Francis wants to know, Tennessee played a neutral site non-conference game every year from 2015 through 2018, but doesn't have one scheduled in the future. Do you see a shift in college football back to home and homes? That would seem like that's uh, Fulmer's preference where Hart loved the neutral site games. If the playoff were expanded to eight teams in the future, it seems like it might, the reward might outweigh the risk in scheduling teams like Oklahoma since you could get in the playoff with two losses, whereas with a fourth playoff team, there isn't much incentive for a game like that other than financially. I, I, I think the, you know, the poster hit the nail on the head. I mean, Phillip, I think Phillip covets games in Neyland Stadium way more so than he does some NFL venue. So 
Um, all those games, including the you know the, the one in West West Virginia over Charlotte, was locked in. I, I don't. I see Tennessee going back to more of the traditional home and home, and, and unless it, unless it's a real, unless it, there's you know a lot of either backing slash perks to you know go on to a you know and neutral site venue. Now that you're selling beer for twelve and thirteen bucks a pop, how much more is a home game worth? That's true. Here's the other thing too. Part of the reason why the neutral site games were such a big deal with Dave Hart. He was trying. He w- he was in the middle of, quite frankly, a pissing contest with the city over taxes. Okay, and he was going to prove to them that hey, I, you know, if you're going to take all this money for parking and taxes, and you're going to charge us for all this other stuff, and we're having to give up so much of the quote gate, so to speak, we'll we'll go to a neutral site game. You know, we'll 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 take a home. And then he used it, hey, recruiting and all this other stuff. But he was trying to make a point to city leaders and county leaders too that you need us. Okay, and that's, you know, there were some things Dave Hart did well at Tennessee. Financially, got Tennessee out of some bad situations. There were some other fights he got into that didn't end up going well for him, a la the Lady Vols name, obviously, which ended up costing him his job. But part of the neutral site thing and why that was such a big deal for him is he was trying to stick it a little bit to um, some deals that he didn't think were very good deals in terms of taxes and stuff like that that the university has to pay to the city. So that was part of the reason why they went there. Uh, let's go to Sly here with the O-line, D-line possibility being a strength for 2020. What other unit could possibly sneak up and become a strength? Also, how much stock are you guys putting into that quarterback room? Uh, I guess you mean how good could a quarterback room could be. What, what, what unit outside of the, of the two lines of scrimmages do you like on this team? Uh, corner. I, yeah, I like corner. If it's, you know, it's not the overall secondary, but I agree with Jesse. I think there's some depth at corner, some experience at corner. Um, you know, and then I, I kind of like Tennessee's running backs. I mean, you know, providing ties back. I mean, you know, they're not – there are several back or backfields in the SEC that probably have more talent, but as far as experience and, you know. Just, well, and if you're saying that the uh, – if you if you're – Going off the offensive line is going to be better. If the offensive line is going to be better. They should be better. They should be better, yeah. And the wild card there, I mean, if you add a guy like Zach Evans' talent to the room, then that only elevates the rest of the group. Yes. What do you think of the quarterback room? I mean, I, I, Unknown? Well, I mean, it's better than it has been in a long time. I mean, you've got a multi-year starter and a five-star freshman coming in, and then you've got Brian Maurer, who is, you know, certainly – been inconsistent, but has at least played and flashed some potential. I mean, I think, I think there's probably a lot of teams who would like to have Tennessee's quarterback room. I would say get back to me at the end of uh, what it looks like after the spring. Depending on who's here and who yeah. performs well. Um, does does how well does Bailey perform in the spring? Where's JG? Uh, where's Brian Mowers focus in the spring? Uh, lots of questions, but there is some talent there. They got some guys who can throw it. And right now, it is that it is unequivocally deep. Right. I mean, it's deeper. They, deeper got, than, they got options. Deeper than most. <laughs> That's for sure. All right, a couple more, and then we're going to wrap it up here. T.N. Hemp's work. Um, who do you see as the most likely impact freshman? We sort of talked about that, but here's his follow up. If Tennessee lands Wideman and Beckwith, how does this receiving class compare to previous receiving classes that Tennessee's brought in? Have to think it's pretty high up there with Hyatt and Wideman both being top 100 type players, as well as the two Jimmies, with Beckwith being sought after as an athlete at tight end. Um, we have to go back and think. I don't know that it's, I don't know that it's Meacham, Swain, Brett Smith, but or, or to Rick Rogers, Justin yeah, Hunter. Yeah, to Rick Rod, Yeah, probably not as good as those two, but it's going to have some depth to it's it. It's better so, than the last couple classes. Yeah, it, it's it is a pretty good haul. I mean, yeah, I mean Jimmy's up there, and you know, right outside the top 100, and Weidman's obviously, you know, got a nice ranking. Um, you know, I think Beckwith's probably. You know, underranked to be honest with you, um, just based off the fact that the kids only played 18 months of football. You know, I mean, you know, he, he never put any kind of effort into it until Will Hester got to uh, to Florence. Only 18 months? Yeah, two years. Wow. Um, all right, Charlie Work is Rob. Is Victor Bailey a better version of Jordan Bowden? This year's Jordan Bowden. No. What do you What do you think of Bailey? I mean, Bailey's a really, really good athlete, but um, he he's not a I mean, he's, he's definitely a combo guard. I think Rick, this offseason, has really tried to push him to develop as a point guard, or not this offseason, but this season where he's sitting out. Um, I mean, he's probably a better athlete than Jordan, just in terms of quick twitch, you know, bo- you know body control, that, that kind of thing. But he's not got, he's not got Jordan's skill, certainly not as, not as a shooter, I don't believe. And 
Probably a better, de- probably a better defender at least when it comes to, to smaller, quicker guys. I mean, he's gonna be a good, he's gonna be a good player for Tennessee. But I would not look for him to be an all all SEC caliber player. All right, Rooster J thirty seven. When is Philip Fulmer going to get Nike to put the double stripes back on the pants? Get larger numbers on the jerseys. I don't know about any more larger numbers on the jerseys. There, as a spotter, there are times I think they're too big. The double stripes are coming back and should be back next year. Yeah, that's that's the pl- that is the plan there. Uh, all right, last one. Vol Lover, uh, or no, excuse me. Uh, yeah, we'll go last two. We've heard a lot about Kaysom Hill and his potential role in his team. Is there a, not a possibility he could be used as a wide receiver given this team's need at the position, maybe as a punter or kick returner? It would seem to be a waste of a talented athletic player if you don't use him somewhere else. I don't know that athletically he, pl- he can play. I don't know. He looks like more of a fullback. I don't know where we've heard a lot about yeah, Kaysom Hill. I was getting ready to say that. <laughs> that was, was going to be my point too, Jesse. I mean, and no, no dog in the kid, but I mean, he. this is a guy who, yes, did start games for a Power 5 program, but then at, upon getting hurt, did – did not have many uh, available options to remain on scholarship I would say he, elsewhere. He, he 100% does not look like a, a receiver. No, not at all. Just linebacker, fullback. Yeah, I don't, I don't. I'm just not sure athletically where he could help any other position. And I didn't give you. I didn't give you an offensive wild card or offensive oh, whatever. Sorry. But just, I, I'm just thinking about <laughs> it. No, no, no. I'm just thinking <laughs> about it. Off. I just, I Velas just Jones. Him. Velas Jones. They need him. He's another guy. I think offensively, he, they need. If no, you, start, starting the hype train. No, I'm not saying. I'm not. <laughs> you got D'Angelo Gibbs putting him in a gold jacket instead of in the Canton. No, I'm saying they need <laughs> that. It, it, you, if you give Velas Jones that spot. He needs to be productive more than just returning a kick or two a game. Yeah, if you're gonna if you're gonna count an initial on that one, then yeah, I agree with you. You got to get more production out of that. Matt, I wants to know: Is there a timetable on a Jeremy Banks return? Any chance he will be a part of winter workouts or spring practice for Tennessee? Anybody? I think you'll see Jeremy Banks back on this football team at some point. Sooner rather I don't, than I don't, later. I don't. I don't later. know if there's. I don't know if there's a firm timetable. I think. I think it would be summertime. Yeah, I think also, it's after spring think? practice. I agree. I, I mean, that way so. you could sell it, you know, publicly. As you, he was suspended for basically a whole academic year, and you know, as opposed to him, him taking part in spring practice. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I, I think they'd like to have him for spring practice, though. Oh, there's nothing. I, I think they'd like to have him for winter workouts later this afternoon if they could get him there. I just don't think. I don't think time-wise they're going to push. It's going to get pushed to, to that point. I think it's probably summertime. If he does come back, if he does come back, does 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 Q stay inside though? Does Banks stay at linebacker? I think Banks stays at linebacker. Me too. So and I think Q and I think I think Q ends up might bumping. go back outside. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see. Depends on how Q. The Q will get the opportunity in the spring if Banks is not here to really show himself. So right. that one will be interesting. So uh, lots going on. Obviously, Junior Day this weekend. Plenty of coverage of that. We're going to chase everything we hear on Zach Evans as well as um, uh, Weidman and. and and deep back with and everybody else. I don't think anybody's doing anything until Wednesday. No. I don't think if you get to this point, I don't think there's going to be any news coming. And from if anybody. you love Braj, just say a prayer between now and then that all three of these kids do something before 10 a.m. <laughs> yeah, if we'll, we'll see how long it takes for them to do something on Wednesday. But we'll keep you tracking on all that coverage of Tennessee basketball as well. But that's going to do it for the VolQuest.com podcast brought to you by Blue Water Climate Control for Rob Lewis, Jesse Simon, and Austin Price. I'm Brent Hubbs. Thanks for joining us. Have a great rest of your Friday and a great weekend, everybody.